Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am the executive director of All Brains Belong Vermont. I'm really glad you're here joining us for our conversation on neurodiversity and relationships. Um, before we get started, um, um, if, if you're new to Brain Club, let's tell, uh, let's explain what this is. <laughs> uh, Brain Club is our very intentionally created education program for purposes of providing education to the community about ABB's approach to neuroinclusive community culture. Um, Brain Club is a place where we bring people together to develop a shared vision of what's possible by promoting new ways of thinking and being. And with the idea that then you go out into the rest of your lives um, and expect um, the world to be inclusive of people with all types of brains. It's a place where we hope that you'll feel safe, a place where you can experience how culture can be different. That's a place where we do a lot of collective learning and unlearning um, of things that no longer serve us. Um, and although All Brains Belong has a variety of different types of programs, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. This is an education program only, so it's not the right place to make personal requests or to problem solve um, individualized, personalized needs. Um, but um, this is an education program and we invite you to explore today's big picture themes and to share ideas or reflections related to the topic at hand. All paths to participation are welcome here. Um, you can have your video on or off, and even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You certainly do not need to sit still and look at the camera by any means, so feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or anything else. Um, and observation is also a valid form of participation. Um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, another thing we do to make things safe for all participants is that we prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. So just be mindful of language used and topics discussed and thinking about the big picture of access needs of the group. And we'll talk about access needs more in a minute. Or right now, um, access needs are anything that um, are, is required for full and meaningful participation in whatever somebody's doing. So everybody with all types of brains has access needs. And there's all different types of access needs. And we'll talk about a lot of these tonight, especially as it relates to communication. Um, speaking of access needs, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also um, do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat so I'll actually see it. Um, if anyone's using it, oh, well, there's lots of people using it. Hello, everyone. Uh, speaking of the chat, um, the chat is a great example where we often have conflicting access needs, where two people's access needs conflict. So for many of our community members, the chat is a way that allows access to this program because it's a way of communicating without mouth words. Um, it allows for more processing time. It also allows for being able to get your ideas out as soon as they come into your mind. So it eases working memory. Um, it's a way of engaging back and forth. It's a way of sharing ideas without, you know, having to insert yourself into conversation. And yet we also know that there are community members for whom the chat is chaos. It causes visual clutter. It's distracting. Um, many people even have a startle response when the chat pops up each time, especially when the chat moves quickly. It can be very hard to follow. So our advice for how we navigate conflicting access needs, because neither one of these sets of access needs is correct. Um, we just have to figure out in neuro-inclusive space, how do we balance these things? So first, if you are someone who is bothered by the chat, here's our advice. The first time the chat pops up, try leaving it open. Don't close it. This way, new text will come, but it won't pop. It only pops once if you leave it open. You could also try disabling the pop-up. It's called chat preview. So next to the chat icon with the speech bubble, there's a little up arrow, click on it. it we'll show the word show chat preview. So if it has a check mark, tap on that or click on that, it will go away. And now hopefully it won't pop up. 
Um, the way we are going to balance that startle response and the difficult to follow, especially when it gets fast, is that we ask you, um, especially during the, the, the part of Brain Club, the, the first, the, I'll, I'll do some slides in a second, but um, we have a pre-recorded video for 30 minutes. So we'll, we'll watch um, a, a pre-recorded um, set of community panelists and uh, then we'll, we'll, and we can have discussion in the chat during that time. And then we'll have um, opportunity to engage in the chat and with mouth words afterwards. But so while, while that's all happening, if you're gonna use the chat, we ask that you type in the big box and try to not use threads or the reply feature because that actually makes it bounce up and down more, which is kind of, this is kind of hard to hard navigate for, for many people, including myself. So we just ask that you type in the big box if you're gonna use the chat. Um, so it's July, welcome to the new month, new theme. So we're going to be talking all month about different examples of bridging the double empathy problem. And we'll talk about what that is in just a minute. Um, but the big picture um, is when we think about relationships, uh, you know, they're complicated for people with all types of brains. Some of the common factors of family and relationship challenges um, for, for neurodivergent folks, um, you know, there's so many things, right? So the double empathy problem is one piece of, of, of uh, this equation, but so many of these other topics we talk about at Brain Club, ableism, internalized ableism, conflicting access needs, all day long conflicting access needs, or about even just not knowing what your access needs are in, in, in multiple people in a relationship. There's executive functioning and communication differences. Or how about folks who don't know how their brains work? Um, let alone have language to describe um, their access needs. Of course, um, you know, intergenerational trauma, intergenerational neurodivergence that's unrecognized, um, culture norm differences, parenting culture, relationship norm culture. So just lots of lots of different things. So this is just one one piece of 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 the puzzle um, or the equation. So the double empathy problem, what is it? The double empathy problem is a term coined by an autistic social scientist called Dr. Damian Milton. And what Dr. Milton found through research, and this has been um, repeated many, many times in research over the past 15 years, um, is that there is no one right set of social skills. It's not like here are the normal social skills and here's the autistic people over here. It's not like that. Um, instead, it's the double empathy problem states that when there is a mismatch of communication style, when there is a mismatch of worldview or how someone experiences the world, that is where communication breakdowns happen. Um, so, and it happens in both directions. So when we talk about bridging the double empathy problem, it's really, it's a, it's, it's, it's perspective taking. It's um, in both directions. It's some um, uh, different ways of zooming out when we have access to the parts of the brain that allow us to zoom out um, in, 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 in the relationships that we're in. And uh, one quote we often share is a couple of years ago, my sweet little love, um, when I was uh, telling them that I was gonna go do a training for some um, helping professionals who work with sweet little loves, um, uh, and um, I, I asked them what I should tell the people. And they said, Mama, tell them there's no right way to be a person. Yup, it's my sweet little love. And so, um, you know, I think, I think further complicating matters. So first off, it's like the, the double empathy problem, like unlearning this whole business because this is, this is the truth. There's no right way to be a person. Um, and even so, even amongst people who know this and who know about their access needs and are able to communicate about them um, and perspective take and, 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 it doesn't mean we necessarily have access to be able to do that. So, um, so many people um, are, are, are deep in neurodivergent burnout 
neurodivergent burnout, um, a condition um, experienced by neurodivergent people of all ages. And um, actually, Lizzie, we forgot we forgot this one. Uh, can you, you be able to pull up the the old Brain Club link? Um, maybe it was 2023, maybe like May or something, spring of 2023, where we did neurodivergent burnout. Um, that might be a good thing to share in the chat. Cool, thanks. Um, oh yeah, we did post about neurodivergent burnout on social media recently. So um, Lizzie put that in the chat. Thank you for doing that. Um, so if, if anybody wants to check that out, and we certainly appreciate anyone who wants to share 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 our posts with your networks that helps increase the, you know, amplify the messages and the, and the, the education. Thank you for doing that. Um, but neurodivergent burnout, um, condition characterized um, by um, having your capacity exceeded by the demands of your life for prolonged periods of time, or then you lose access to skills, you lose access to tolerating stimuli, um, you experience profound levels of exhaustion, physical, mental, emotional. And of course, that's going to play out in relationships too. Um, I really like this title of this article um, by Raymaker et al. Um, having all of your internal resources exhausted beyond measure and being left with no cleanup crew, defining autistic burnout. Um, uh, oh, thanks. Lizzie posted this article. I love this article so much. Anyway, um, just like knowing that this is a thing and matching that pattern when you experience it or when you can when you recognize it um, in, in the people you are in relationship with um, is really helpful. So all of these layers of, 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 of complication um, uh, that, that, that just to set the, the tone, we're going to watch um, two short clips from two past brain clubs from um, a, a little over a year ago, um, where we will see how this plays out for the people in our community. David, take it away. And again, we'll have the chat running if anybody would like to engage as we watch, um, but the two videos combined will run about 30 minutes. How this connects to access needs are that we all have access needs. Access needs are anything that is required to meaningfully participate in one's environment or community. And as I said, we all have them. This might be physical access needs, emotional, communication, you know, like it's so all different types of access needs. And so often we get the message that if we have needs, we are in some way needy and um, explicitly or implicitly, sometimes, often people get the message that we shouldn't have needs, that it's selfish to have needs. Like that's not a thing, that's a myth. And um, that is um, really hard because when we think about full participation in our world and our lives, the social model of disability is about the barriers in the environment between the person and full participation. And it's not about there being something wrong with the individual, it's about those barriers being in place. And so we want to have as few barriers to full participation as possible. And when we think about um, how this how this plays out in interpersonal relationships, I'm going to play a little. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw in a little excerpt from a brain club we did in January called "Everyone Flips Their Lid," um, where you know there's things that that make us stress that are going to differ person to person and like context specific. Like if there's something in the physical environment, like a loud sound. If I'm like well hydrated and well rested, I might not be as stressed as if I'm, you know, haven't done those things or have like a huge cognitive load or whatever. Like with this business of the zoom and the link and the whatever and all the switching between things. If if a motorcycle drives by my house right now, I'm gonna flip my lid. Whereas like I might have been okay a couple hours ago. So um, when we get triggered, when and borrowing from a um, a model from Dr. Dan Siegel, Dr. Tina Green Bryson uh, from the whole brain child, upstairs brain and downstairs brain. When downstairs brain gets triggered, we don't get to pick what triggers us. And 
sometimes we forget that there that we have interpersonal access needs. It's not just about sensory processing or like how we learn. It's it, it's about access needs in a relationship. What does it mean for downstairs brain to feel safe? And so um, when we think about, since we all have access needs, often those access needs conflict with other people. And I might play this clip. I might just come back to it. Well, maybe. It depends on if I can just unshare and reshare. There you go. I gotta share this sound, but it's not gonna work. Mm. Oh, we can invite all 12 of your brothers what? to stay no. with us. No, 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 of no. course we have the room. Just I don't wait. know some of them. Slow must... down. No one's brothers are staying here. No one is getting married. Wait, what? May I talk to you, please? Alone? No. Whatever you have to say, you, you can say to both of us. Fine. You can't marry a man you just met. You can if it's true love. Anna, what do you know about true love? Well, more than you. All you know is how to shut people out. You asked for my blessing, but my answer is no. Now, excuse me. Your Majesty, if I may ease no, your... No, you may not, and I, I think you should go. The party is over. Close the gates. Yes, Your Majesty. Elsa, no, no, wait. Give me my glove. Elsa, please, please. I can't live like this anymore. Then leave. What did I ever do to you? Enough, Anna. No, why? Why do you shut me out? Why, why do you shut the world out? What are you so afraid of? I said enough! So, um, here we have a relationship with two people with access needs. One is looking to assert them by taking space. One has foot on the gas with an access need to communicate right here and now. Boom, that didn't work out so well. I'm curious, anybody else ever experienced conflicting access needs in an interpersonal interaction? Get some nods? Relationships are hard. Hi, Matthew. Are you are you um are, are are you raising your hand to say yes? I have conflicting access needs in interpersonal interactions, or did you want to say something? Yes, Mel. Mel. Yes. 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 Du double. Yes. You know. <laughs> yes. Con conflicting access needs, but also trying to interpret those needs in a way where the other party makes sense, can understand you too as well. It's just it goes both ways and to understand that together is one way to actually you know what are the ideas and thoughts of you know addressing those access needs thank you totally and especially when we have not um we're not in it a culture where it is common for people to actually voice their access needs Access needs are not implied um, because, in fact, people are not mind readers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, I was talking with some folks um, about friendships and how hard it is to make friends and that they're constantly worried about the way their friends are going to respond to them and like worried that they're not going to um be able to um like you know that they're going to be judged and that it's like it's pretty stressful um so i'm wondering i i i'm wondering how that how that resonates with with others about worrying about about the judgment in social interactions for me in the family, the way that I return to regulation, the way that I and bring my nervous system back into reading other people's attunement, reading other people's nervous system, instead of being overwhelmed by my own, whatever it is <laughs> going on, 
the way that the best way for me to do that is to get down on the ground. Again, this is me, and this is experiments of years of knowing how to attune. For me, it's 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 squatting down close. It's putting both my hands on the ground for a second, the floor. So I'm I squat and I'm low. There's something about the proprioceptive work, like I think because my glutes kick in so much, I'm like, oh, here's my body. And because I get into flexion, I'm like, oh, here I am. This is my contained little nervous system. Putting my hands on the ground feels strong. I feel like, yep, I'm, I am strong. I am a strong person. I can do this. So I'm building from the sensory system back into regulation. And I've practiced it enough over the years that I can do it fairly quickly in my nervous system. Those cues kick in safety for my for my neuroception. And it's subconscious. It's, it is something our, our brains are always doing all the time scanning the environment, scanning the interrelationships, scanning the internal relationship, the internal environment for safety. Um, and we are geared for it. So once we feel it, once we find it, it's, it's what our system wants to go to. That homeostasis is where we want to be cellularly, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so for my nervous system, it's that. It's getting low. It's getting grounded. It's softening my face, like actively saying, let your eyes soften. Um, don't create some expected emotion. So that like that shame, fear response might might create this expected like, oh, I'm okay. Right? Like everything's fine <laughs> can you tell this isn't really a smile <laughs> like but it, it's what we do because it's what we've been socialized to do so actively neutralizing softening my face and then like something about the environment for me usually helps find the horizon look at a tree root some sort of cue to me that's like there's no saber-toothed tiger here there's no gaping hole that's going to suck you into the hot molten lava of the middle of the earth. This is solid ground. So you're describing that you begin with a bottom up strategy. You get into your body and you ground yourself, whatever that means to you, you ground yourself. And then you have access to your cortex where you are cortically mediating your limbic response um, because now you have access to your cortex because you did that initial bottom up yep. softening to take the edge off to like bring your cortex back online and then you yep. go to that i think a lot of people skip right to that or they try to skip right to that and they don't have access to their cortex and they you you, you can't skip it you have to do something to access your cortex yep. and there's an element of um like when you're in the thick of it even if you're like already screaming and like actively flipping your lid um, oh, yeah. you you don't have access to the impulse control to stop you don't you you may not even be able to like metacognitive metacognitively um like zoom out and watch yourself you just don't have access to that so it's really just like it's happening Get to the ground if that's how you ground um like yep. something in your body yep yeah yeah and it's ex it's it's experimental for a while it's trial and error to figure out wh what your ph physical somatosensory system responds to and then once that is kind of once that's a cue of safety for your physical sensory being it grows, it gets stronger. Um, and sometimes maybe it needs tweaking, like, you know, when my knees can't squat anymore and hopefully not for another 20 years, I'll have to figure something else out. <laughs> right, right. The other thing is that um, if, if someone knows that they are their go-to self-reg plan is a top down trying to use their cortex yep. Yep. one thing that i found helpful is 
to prepare ahead of time what I'm wanting my cortex to do. Yep. Because if I can, like, uh, ideate and motor plan it ahead of time, I can maybe access it as like automatic like an automatic loop I can pull in as opposed yep. to trying to use it in the, in the moment, because then it becomes not an, a stop, you know, impulse yes. control stop. It's like, don't like, like foot's on the gas already. Don't try to step on the brake of stop screaming at your kid. Um, it's I'm going to go to my automatic loop. And yep. so for me, that is like the, the, like I said before, the, the mantra of like the relationship, the relationship, the relationship is primary. Like whatever that, like, 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 like a thought I can try, even if I don't have full access to my cortex that I can, I can try that. I mean, it doesn't work maybe, but like, it might yeah. work a lot better than like, I'm going to talk myself out of how this is not, this is okay. Right. Well, I mean, and this is also gets to some of the cores of like, there's the unnumberable amounts of different brains. You think when we've talked about this, you think in specific word patterns, always your directions are in go left at and to stop lights then to, to, so your brain does everything in that language sp space and i do not <laughs> i do pictures and i i i know which rock is at the driveway that i want to drive into not where it is on the street in words ways so I think that's also just a self-awareness piece of what works for your brain and language works for yours. I feel so seen right now. <laughs> I, 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 the, the language doesn't work great in my brain. So to start to do like an internal talk in the midst of feeling really dysregulated is just like, oh, that's really, that would be too much work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, so it begins with self-awareness of like what what actually calms you right. and maybe even developing an awareness of like your go-to patterns of how you negotiate life even when you're like generally regulated enough yeah yeah no absolutely which then i mean gives you that base of being able to have the space for your family to feel safe and heard and seen um because the, i mean the 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 goal is acceptance and connection for all of us and that requires me also having that grace and acceptance of like uh, yeah i understand myself sometimes <laughs> so luna and i have been discussing power lately because mm -hmm. like, she's five and she what's modeled for her like in video games or cartoons is like power over people mm -hmm. and like power over people feels gross to me as a pda -er. like i don't want people i don't want power over me and i don't want to have power over people because it's gross so like yeah. we watch a lot of my little pony where like the messages are that the people seeking power over they never prosper it's the power of friendship the power of connection the power of co-regulation which is like you know like um like a reciprocal power like it's just anyway so like we've been talking about like just like the different kinds of power and where do we get power because i feel like the like transformation from like you know like the traumatic transformation toward narcissism cuz like yeah. i mean you can start off as you know like you know for, for you're like a little kid and everyone has power over you and you like seek out to have power over like you don't have power you seek your power you want to claim your power and like if you only know about power over you go down that train right and like if you don't have connection like ah anyway like what do you think about this as a concept uh -huh. yeah i think it really aligns too with the role of punishment in relationships and how power over that the main leverage that you get if you have power over somebody is both controlling them and punishing them. And I think that like uh, manipulating their behavior towards your good 
And if they aren't aligned with that, then they deserve to be hurt for their transgression. And, you know, that's our world. Like we, we let literally live in systems built on that. Yes. And for our kids, they're, they're trying to make sense of what happens when something is transgressed. Like, what do we, what do we do when a line is broken or um, like within the trust, like trust gets broken or connection gets severed and we make mistakes basically. And so in a power over relationship, what happens around mistakes? Well, mistakes are punished and in a power with or a power like in a co-regulation relationship where I mean, power doesn't even, the power is in the connection. Right. Totally. And because and I feel like, I'm like, I'm even hearing language from my five-year-old, like, like a thing that comes out a lot when like I make a mistake and then she'll say something like, you know, so like she might like, you know, Mah! And she'll be like, that's what you get for X. And I'm like, where, where did you get? I like, like, I mean, there's like a lot of things she says and I'm like, damn it. That came from me. Ah." But like, I don't say that. That one doesn't come out. Maybe I think it, or like, maybe I, I don't know. I don't even know. Like, is it TV? Is it, I have no idea. I have no idea. Like my husband, or I have no idea. Like if somebody actually says that, but like, I think that it's just the narrative constructed from observations of the world. That's what you get for x as opposed to like you know like um uh we have a a, a a pediatric occupational therapist on our board who i like would love for you to meet um hannah bloom who um she talks a lot about the the, the cycle of repair and like you know so like you know we're all gonna transgress we're all gonna make mistakes but like it's the repair that closes that loop and you know like most of us grew up in a world where there was no repair, you know, just like, you know, punish, 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 you know, flip your lid, which is, you know, normal to flip your lid, but like, you know, no repair. Yeah, absolutely. And the repair with yourself is what I see, especially for my kids that they're externalizing like that's what you get for is what they say to themselves too like when they make a mistake then they're saying well of course your grown-up is going to ignore you or yell at you because that's what you get you you messed up and this sense that they deserve punishment is really hard to repair because our world is reinforcing that and so it's kind of like that's the cosmic repair work is repairing that relationship with yourself where you have the capacity to say i'm a person who makes mistakes and i'm also a person whoa to even begin Right. Good timing. So there's so much of that. So connecting all those little threads um, to perspective taking. So there's there's this opportunity, right, of like not only thinking through present day situations, but like so many past interpersonal conflicts and all of it um and as monique shares in the chat there was no repair in my childhood not even a recognize not a recognition of my meltdowns they were just ignored right and so like the like the whatever that says or whatever that said to little you um you you probably constructed some kind of narrative around that i think we all do um and it probably wasn't like a helpful one because that's that's what goes on right so like, when you're a little kid and something happens, especially if you have the kind of brain that derives safety from predictable systems, we're constantly creating our own narratives. And um, unless, and this, which is why I think it's so important for, um, you know, neurodivergent young children to learn about their brains as early as possible, um, so that the narrative is like an accurate one. Because if you, if you don't, sweet little loves make up their own narratives, which is almost always unbroken, I'm defective. Uh, 
Okay, got video number two. I think it sounds like we solved the situation. I think being in a neuromixed family, there is this ableist assumption that like neurodivergent folks have access needs and neurotypical folks don't. And I think just coming to an understanding of you have needs, I have needs, all of our needs are valid and recognizing my own has helped me not, I hope, I think, not, not make my other people in my life feel so othered by their needs, by kind of owning mine and using that as a communication tool to talk about mine and talk about theirs. And I think it helps me not place blame on one person for their needs um, to kind of recognize what my own are. And I think that's been really helpful in reshaping the way that I think about my family and the way that I think about like the needs of each person in my family as being all important and all priorities and all equal in what they are. But I think when you only name the needs of one or two people in your family, it automatically creates tears. And I think having words for access needs and starting to know what those are, A, helps them be met and B, helps make me better at meeting other people's needs. And so the fact that I'm sort of like understanding the importance of safety as a need for me now at this point, Point in my life is really allowing me to take some risks and trust some people and try to figure out what is the more authentic for me just by understanding what the scope of safety is. It's amazing. And I wonder how how for you does that connect to because i mean when you spoke about trust and trusting other people it's like like the experience of belonging like 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 what's the relationship between for you like belonging and the safety now that you know you need and are seeking like do those things connect at all yeah i absolutely i think i think they absolutely go together and i think what's um i think more than that too is that I'm able to um now that I'm aware of it I'm able to voice that for my kids who are dealing with similar neuroception like I'm able to go into their spaces their activities their schooling and say like this is this is what they need let's figure out how to create it I, I don't know I mean for, for for me as a parent being surrounded by other people who see the world as I do, or like want to see the world as I do, that's what, that, that's what allows me to unlearn or question assumptions or whatever. I don't feel like I'm like making it up because I'm surrounded by other people who get it. Did, 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 did you have that before Brain Club? Like, did you have like, no. I, th I think, I think that part of it for me is that, like you're saying, people who, I wouldn't say for me, it's been people who share the way I see the world necessarily as people who share the way I want to see the world and what I want the world to be. And I feel like, I, I feel like there isn't a good space to dream like that in the, in the real world. And I think brain club has made me feel like there are new possibilities that I hadn't even had the idea to dream of before brain club. And I feel like having those conversations with people makes me realize what I want things to look like and feel like, and then start on that path to try and make things closer to that dream. Really thankful for the people that, that show up and not just, you know, what am I trying to say? The, the people that show up in all the ways that they show up. Oh, that's beautiful. No, that's exactly right. It's like, it's not all brains belong doesn't do the thing. All Brains Belong um, provides a structure and framework for the people, the, you know, the village members to like rally together in this like, you know, this, this beautiful community of, of doing it differently, of reimagining, like you said, and, you know, reimagining a better life.
I want to share a couple of things with you before we open this up for conversation. So, um, a year ago, um, in October of 2022, we did a brain club on neuro inclusive social space. And we introduced this framework of what creates neuro inclusive space three things one, setting ground rules. Two, explicitly normalizing diversity. And three, normalizing access needs and navigating conflicting access needs because it's inevitable. And um, uh, it, it, and, and so uh, a year ago, we also, we had a kids program in person in the woods. Um, and we would write these things out with, with pictures to demonstrate them like on the cement um, because it, it, it really makes a huge difference. And even, even teaching young kids, you know, five to 10 year olds about this is, it's just part of the key to the universe. So I'm gonna share some quotes um, from another uh, community member. Ground rules, there's something very reassuring about that way of grounding us each time as we begin. And I think we, we heard that from several, several folks in the video. Normalizing diversity, no right way to participate. I feel liberated by being accepted as I am, say, because I'd rather respond to questions in writing or knowing that I can be fully present in a session of Brain Club without having to say anything. Reading the chat. Did you shut that off? I did shut that off. It sounds oh, okay. like there's some, I'm, I'm getting a whole bunch of messages from people that they're seeing things that I don't see. And so um, this is part of that whole thing of, queuing safety to the masses. So I just figured I'd shut that down and we'll just shift to our conversation part. And we'll work on our, uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. We'll work on our tech situation um, after Brain Club. Um, so, um, just in like full transparency, um, my brain just spent a whole bunch of extra cognitive resources like problem solving and like imagining what could be wrong and trying to visualize the words of what was described and seeking more data out and communicating and like it's very meta right because that's that's what goes on all day in the world um and so um so it is so it is um you know, these things happen in life and, and it's okay. So thank you all for, for your patience. Um, you know, uh, a couple things that, that, um, that have come up in the chat, people talking about their experiences relating intergenerationally and then, and how, how that the early childhood narratives particularly um, formed by unrecognized um, parents or caregivers and, 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 and all of that. Um, yeah, so common. Just gonna share, oh, I did share screen. Okay, here we go. Um, so I would love to just open this up um, to, to folks who've been, First, we'll start with just folks who've been part of Brain Club for a while, um, and just to to create some space for anyone to share some share some thoughts of what's coming up for you. Um, whether the experience of reflecting on some of these issues, hearing that you're not alone, you know, has what 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 has that been like for you who've been around a little while?
Thanks, Christina. So Christina is saying, um, I think Brain Club has allowed me to see how so many brains are different. Yeah. Reminds me of a, a comment um, that Sierra had earlier as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, experiences, a couple of people sharing earlier around like not recognizing, not learning about how your own brain works. Often, you know, it's so common, right, that that um, neurodivergent adults don't often don't learn of anything. I mean, actually, I don't want to say neurodivergent adults, um, but I, I just say neurodivergent people often don't learn about how our brains work, whether you are identified in young childhood and still no one teaches you how your brains work, you know, so because you're embedded in the systems that are like, rooted in the deficit based model of, of the healthcare system. Um, or you're an adult who now in the setting of neurodivergent burnout, like now you're no longer, you know, able, able to do things that you had been previously doing even. So like, what would it look like for people to learn about how their brains work before they reach such depths of suffering? So, you know, with the, the, the double empathy problem um, is referring to a mismatch of neurotype, but, but even amongst neurodivergent people, um, the conflicting access need situation is real. It is real. Um, so I'd love to hear if, if uh, open it up to anybody, whether you've been around here for, hold on, what's happening? Hold on, hold on. Nope, nope, nope. Recording nope. stopped. I'm going to hold on a second. I don't um I don't know what is going to happen. I am hold on. Okay. Everything okay. It seems every time I put something in chat that happens. Is it just a coincidence or am I doing so something? Strange. I don't know about that, but it also sounds like we will we will now we have something else to work on for sure. Whew. Naomi. No, okay, okay. Um who who is um all right, I I I am just going to do that. Okay. I have shut that down. I don't know if anyone else has the kind of brain that when um, your sympathetic nervous system responds, it interferes with motor planning. And so like I, all I was able to do is like, hold on, hold on. But like the actual planning and clicking and dragging and like opening up the participant list and searching for something to remove, um, that was really hard. And yet talking it out loud, um, made it easier to do. So thanks for doing that with me. Woo! And in front of an Better. audience, no less. In front of an audience, right? Yeah, exactly. I know it. Hello, hello. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. No fun. But we're here. We're here. We all get you. I dropped you. I, dro I think it's an admin perm. We can restrict who shares in sh or share screen in chat, and that should fix it a little bit. Thank you. I will, uh, I will, I will explore that. I, I think what most, most dysregulated me was like the idea of like, this is not a host. How is a non-host sharing screen? What has gone on? We're all here it's for it, Mal. No worries. We're all family here. It's all good. All Thank good. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Naomi, I'm sorry for that. So Naomi and then Michelle. Uh, so hi everyone. This is really helpful. And Mel, thank you for hosting this with your team. Um, what I want to say, um, and I speak both as an autistic psychologist and uh, someone who's coming of age at midlife, um, that it's not just the neurotypical and the neurodiverse or the neurodiverse with the neurodiverse. It's also that, as people said with the IFS, different parts of our defense mechanisms and capacities 
drive the bus when we have different amounts of energy spoons. And when I have been in relationship with someone who understands all those layers, which is a tiny percentage of the population, we can unpack and uh, disentangle that. And when I don't have somebody who understands that, it's excruciating because they don't understand that some of my younger parts, which I call my dragons, um, might have reacted with defensiveness or low energy spoons and that I can unpack it at a later time, but then they're no longer open to hearing it. So, um, and then the other piece is that when you're neurodiverse, you're all different kinds of snowflakes. So the reason it can be really hard to find a partner or a friend is because one, we live in a culture that doesn't really know how to go deep. And secondly, not all neurodiverse people go deep in the same way. So finding someone that like matches up can feel like um, one of those gambling machines where you pull the handle and you're trying to get all the same image across the screen. And it's just, for me, it's been excruciating to find uh, friends and connections and that it's so important to have autistic uh, neurodiverse cafes or social groups because even there there's some people with completely different skills as we all know than others and finding people that interlace with your skill set and who can process disconnects when they come up like the frozen video it's just a rare thing because we don't get taught how to do authentic communication and processing and explaining our parts and so the explosion happens with some kind of meltdown and people don't realize that's not narcissism. That's not bullying or abusiveness. That's like being in defense mode and being compromised. And it's, it's very painful because especially those of us who have been diagnosed at midlife, we have often had ongoing complex PTSD because the social uh, IEDs keep going off. And even if you know how to process it, if the other person doesn't, it's very lonely to be able to meta understand and be alone with that. And I will say mic drop. I remember that from last time when you taught us that. I loved that so much. Yeah, Naomi, all to that, like, uh, like a thousand percent, everything what you just said. Um, so I think just naming these things are really, really important. I think one thing just to explicitly name that um, relates to the clash that is that is coming that is um that many people have named in the chat as well is this idea of like i can only speak for myself but like rejection sensitive dysphoria when people are not aware of their own rejection sensitive dysphoria um responses to feedback drive the co-dysregulation so if somebody's like you know, here are my access needs, here's what I need. And the other person experiences that as their, you know, their limbic system sounds the alarm because neutral feedback was given about someone else's needs. Well, that's not, that doesn't result in anybody co-regulating. And so it's just, it's chaos and it happens all day long, not just in neuro mixed relationships, but in all relationships. It's just being aware of these things. So thanks Naomi for your comments. Uh, Michelle and then Kit. Shall you still around? If not, we can come back. We can come back to you. Let's let's hear from Kit and then we'll come back to Michelle. Thanks. Um, one of the things that is coming up for me and has been coming up for me a lot. Um, as a parent and, and just in the context of thinking about all of these great things that are being shared is um, the challenge of communicating while holding like multiple brains or identities in mind um, and how much of uh, um, an individual <laughs> that I um, 
uh, am holding in a given moment, I think can really shift depending on the context. But, um, and that will completely just like um, limit or, or destroy my ability to actually think through a question, a simple question, a planning piece, any other executive um, task that is significant and that requires like critical reflection. If my kids are in the room, even if they're doing something else, I, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be able to get to that <laughs> um, until they're asleep. And I think um, what's interesting to me is how in that circumstance, I think it's compounded by how much of that individual I hold because I, I'm thinking and holding so much in a given moment. But in other spaces where I, um, I don't feel understood or seen, um, or I feel like I'm being misunderstood or um, I'm experiencing, you know, like uncertainty about what is expected of me, I, I end up in the same place, you know, but I've gotten there in a different way. And it, at times it, it does feel like it's interesting. I've been thinking about the term dysphoria and, um, and I haven't, whether it's, it's the dysphoria of rejection or or like because sometimes I might feel that but sometimes it feels specific to the context of having an awareness of a, you know like a, a sort of intuitive awareness of that double empathy piece right <laughs> of it's not aligning like as my son would say I I don't belong you know like I'm from another planet that's sort of like when you're experience that sense of just like real difference and how that can just kind of shut down um, our communication pathways. I just want to let that sink in and process what you said, like, cause 1000% all of that. Right. And so even now having a window or a lens of understanding, like to, to have some like retro perspective, like, oh yeah, that's why I have felt different or that's why I've been misunderstood by so many people for so many years in so many contexts. Like, yeah, that you might have an awareness of that now, but it doesn't actually change the, those, the, 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 the pain and the trauma of all that lives in our nervous systems. Like it, it lives there. And so it's, it's not as simple as like, now I understand why that made that anyway. So if something happens, it brings it right back a, a trauma response. And I think the reality of, an access need for, you know, when um, kids mentioning, like, I don't have access to my executive functions when I'm like caring for children or, you know, it, like I could say the same, um, not just caring for children, but like if there's a lawnmower outside my window, like it's just, I don't have any available bandwidth left. Right. So it's just, it is what it is. I, I have an access need for quiet and nothing else happening. And if I don't have that, I can't do the thing. And by the thing, I mean anything. And that's really hard. And it's true. Michelle, are you back yet? Hi, uh, hi. Yeah, I was talking. Whoops. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Maybe you were muted before. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I was talking. You didn't realize the mute was on. But um, yeah, the safety thing is a, 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 a tough issue for me because I have such severe sensory issues and they're just getting worse as I get older. And I've had, you know, a couple of concussions and stuff. So I think, you know, something's just not working right. And, and, um, so like the ambient noise in a room, like if I'm taking a class or something, or if it's an informal social setting and everyone's out as like meeting and being social, it's just so hard for me because I, I just can't even focus on what I'm supposed to be doing. And and um, it's, it's like my amygdala just like starts jumping in and doing its thing and my voice gets tight and, my, and, and high pitched and people think I'm high strung for no reason because they can't see the reason because it's, it's, it's an invisible disability. And like, I just had a, a, a social gathering for the chorus that just ended, you know, for the summer and not very many people attended it. So it was a little bit easier to take, but um, I brought my like noise canceling headphones because I was afraid if that, you know, conversation got too bad, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be good for me. And, and, and that high pitched voice thing, sometimes um, like, I don't even know it's, it's happening. And um, I, I also like, like I, 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 like my husband calls me high maintenance or a bitch or whatever because I'm, you know, because it's it sounds 
squeaky and high and you know like like I'm being um strident that's another word he uses so it's it's really hard for me to like let people know what's going on with me because they can't see it to begin with and then what they are seeing coming out of me sounds like I'm starting things like I'm I'm starting being a bully or something because of the way I'm talking or whatever and it's 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 just really hard to um, you know, get, get, get a handle on that and get support around that. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing, Michelle. So first off, spoken speech is a really complex motor skill. So to be able to actually get, you know, the, you, you think of the words, brain sends message to the motor parts of your, you know, your lips, your tongue, your teeth, you know, like th this whole apparatus, plus like, air coming out like at a like vocal cords coming together and air coming through them and it's all happening in a coordinated manner that's like you take this for granted it's not to be taken for granted it's really really complicated and so when dysregulated even people who do have access to mouth words and of course there are many people who don't um they they don't communicate with mouth words and there are people who do communicate with mouth words who lose access to them when dysregulated and that's very common um and so anyway just acknowledging that and like learning about that and actually learning about different ways of of communicating your needs without relying on spoken speech you know using alternative augmentative communication things like that um, but anyway, I just want to validate and acknowledge like I wish I could lose, lose my ability to speak because I think it would go better for me. <laughs> right. So maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe even just sort of recognizing that, um, you know, I, I'm like learning, learning how to rec I think learning how to recognize dysregulation in oneself and other people is a really like it's a it's a journey. So like, oh, I'm getting dysregulated. I'm going to not try to use mouth words right? just something something like that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us up by reading two quotes in the chat. Um, Paul says, um, "I'm at a lack of words to describe exactly what Brain Club and Auburn's Belong has meant to me, but it's given me so much validation in who I am. It made me realize how alone I felt, and has introduced me to a group of people who get it. I now try to communicate my needs to people who maybe don't get it because I'm learning this stuff at 54. It's great to know um, that that uh, ABB is helping kids learn about themselves before too much damage is done." Yeah. Yeah. That, thank you, Paul. Thanks for saying that. Sierra did a group for kids earlier today um, where um, the, the topics that she covered were topics that adults have shared tonight. You know, what are the environments that make me feel comfortable? What are the environments that make me feel uncomfortable? What are things I can do when I don't have what, what my needs are? And like sweet little loves were talking about this stuff. It was pretty magical. And um, we're going to read, read Christina's quote. Oh, there's so much magic that has come in the chat since, since I spotted Christina's quote. Um, Christina says, um, I'm so glad I'm learning about my brain because I think of how I would have loved to have me as a parent. Makes me feel like I'm doing okay for them. Chills, chills. Amen to that, Christina. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for being for being here tonight. Thanks again for for your understanding and grace with our tech stuff. And um, I hope you have a great week um, next week. What are we doing next week? We are doing. What's happening, Lizzie? We're doing healthcare next week. Hold on. Let me tell you what we're doing next week. So next week. Yes, next week, the double empathy problem and healthcare. Um, we're gonna be revisiting um, an, uh, an, an, an oldie but a goodie uh, reflections from um, healthcare providers about the double empathy problem in healthcare. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. Bye.